Thanks for joining us, guys. We'll start in just a few minutes, admitting the rest of the people. We've got about 50 joining us today. I'm going to give everyone about 60 more seconds or so because there's quite a few people and I have to keep clicking admit. So. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm sure we'll have plenty of interesting noises behind everybody if, if we have the audio on. <laughs> Give it one more minute. All right, everybody. It's so good to have you guys here. My name is Micah Bellew. I'm the CEO and founder of Fluency Corp. We do corporate language training and we work with a lot of Japanese companies. And so that is why we wanted to dive into this. And 
I have not worked and lived in Japan for a long time. I have been taking Japanese classes for six years, but it's not the same as living and working there, which is why I have asked Hannah McCulley to join us and she'll do a little intro of herself. Hi everyone, so glad to see you here. Um, my name's Hannah McCauley. I, uh, I lived in Japan for a total of 10 years. Um, I uh, actually graduated from an international university in Japan called ICU. I majored in English linguistics and then I went on to teach at a Japanese school, uh, mainly a high school and university. And I also have some experiences working with, with Japanese business profession, uh, professionals who wanted to work on their English skills. Awesome. That's People right. Are so right. <laughs> Very good. So we would like to know who is in the audience here today. And if you guys uh, could please make sure you are on mute because we are going to hear the wind and dogs and children and everything. Thank you so much. And what I'd like to do is first get to know you all to see who is with us here today and why you have come. So we're gonna do our first poll right now. I'm gonna launch it right now and kind of figure out who is in our audience. Finish the sentence. You're currently working with Japanese people and or companies. You hope to work with Japanese people and or companies and you want to be prepared or you just find this interesting and you don't currently work with any and probably will not. As we suspected, over 90% so far currently working with Japanese people and or companies here in the US and also traveling abroad to work with them there. Either way, the goal is to have a harmonious communication and understanding of each other. And to do that, we kind of have to understand why we do what we do and how we typically communicate. So that is what we are going to look at. So I'm gonna share the results that I just got. As you can see, overwhelming people working currently with Japanese people and some people trying to prepare. So just a little bit. All right, let's get into it. Let me make a brief introdu introduction for the purpose of this um, webinar. I am not trying to convince anyone to adapt to the Japanese standards of business culture, but rather I just want to present some information of not only why, but like how um, the Japanese workplace kind of functions to give you guys a better understanding. That way there's less, um, you know, instances of probably miscommunications and misunderstanding, which could cause some conflict. So this is for everyone just to kind of gain a, a general understanding of Japanese business culture. Exactly. Perfect. Well, Hannah, I'll let you take it away. Would you like slide one? Uh, yes, please. Here we go. Okay. So I think everyone kind of has like the stereotype of uh, Japanese people being a little bit more introverted. And I want to make sure I make that clear, like not in as in they're not sociable because, you know, everything in Japan, Japanese culture is about maintaining harmony, but they may come across as being a little bit reserved. And the reason for that is that I feel like in Japanese culture, there is a, a importance of group solidarity over individualism. And that goes for outside of the work too. That's just every day in interactions. One of the aspects of, I, I would feel as we call um, honne versus tatamai, tatemai. So honne is like your true feelings, your true opinions, kind of like um, how you really feel about things on the inside. And there are places where you're open to express that but when you kind of show your face to the outside world, you are showing your tatemai or your public facade. So you're gonna kind of reserve your more inner, most true opinions to kind of get along with everyone essentially in the society around you, whether it's your friends or workplace. And there is a basically, I wanna say that I think maybe from a Western perspective, we may misconstrue that as being you know, fake or inauthentic, 
but you could also look at it in a way as it's simply being courteous. You don't want to hurt anyone's feelings. You don't want to make them feel uncomfortable. So you are showing a face that is going to help keep that group dynamic and that group harmony. Yeah, that, that's really interesting. Um, I have spent a lot of time with um, French families and French friends. And I remember they told me at the beginning that they said they thought that I was fake because I was smiling all the time. Because you couldn't possibly be happy all the time. And it's very interesting because that's their perception of what the smile, the smile means, right? And so if somebody is very courteous or always acting the correct way, you might think of it as fake, but just like a smile in the South, it's just how it is. It, it's just like breathing, right? Mm -hmm. If you pass someone on the street in the South in general, you smile, it's, it's automatic. And so it's not a certain way, it just might be from your life experiences, that's how you are perceiving it. So being open-minded about why, and we can think of it as well, you know? If you're from Texas, you might smile, and, and so it's an automatic for you, and the Japanese business culture, this automatic of correctness or keeping the harmony of the group, which is, I mean, if I can say so, pretty opposite of the Western idea or the American idea, you know, you wanna stand out, so interesting. Another example of that I would say sometimes maybe your colleagues may feel uncomfortable if you single them out, even if it means to praise them because their idea is like, hey, we're a whole group and why are you singling me out? Because I'm not supposed to be singled out. There's a saying in Japanese society that the nail that gets that sticks out gets hammered down. That, that kind of drives that kind of group mentality and the importance of belonging in a group and everyone kind of working in that one unit. So you want to blend and not stand out. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. That's hard. <laughs> Here we go. Okay. And I feel like this is very prevalent in most Asian cultures. There is this whole idea of respecting your elders and that is also very prevalent in Japan. And usually within companies, the older and more experienced person is gonna be the higher up. So you wanna show difference for like the CEO, for the most cases, they're going to be like between, you know, in their 60, 65 with 43 years in the company. So for example, not that, that that's a, you know, such a huge thing, but just it would, it would show that you're a kind of understanding of their culture that when you go into an environment, a business environment, whether it be a meeting or not, that you acknowledge the eldest person first, you give your business card to the, to the eldest person first basically. And like I said, they kind of know that, hey, you know, our culture is different. We don't expect you to really know, but it just, it's, it works in your favor to kind of show that knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. And this is incredible, right? How many people in the U.S. can say they've been at a company 43 years? I hear that a lot mm -hmm. from, I mean, it's, it's, when you started a company in your 20s right out of college, a lot of times it's also where you retire, which is a very different idea. I think the average American changes jobs like five times, maybe careers another five. <laughs> so that's fascinating. It's so different. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. So before we do this slide, I would actually like to know one more thing about the group. Before we go into what are some of the challenges that we think that some people are having, I would really like to see what challenges are you guys having? So let me see if I can get out of this. There we go. Okay. So this is our second poll of the sec session, second and last. What challenges are you having? We wrote down some challenges that we think you might be having but we would like to hear from you. And you can choose more than one. So maybe you have a couple.
Okay, 11 people voted. Give me a couple more. Let's get to 15. I want to get to know you. Ah. Oh, over 20. Okay, just popped all, everyone just got done and all came through. Okay, one more second. Any stragglers? All right. Here we go. Share results. So not many people said that, you know, they did what they were asked, but they didn't seem like they could fulfill what the company coworkers or clients wanted. I think the overwhelming, there's about three that are tied. Awkward silences on calls or in meetings, not sure what to do or say, not sure if I'm doing something wrong. That was my addition of how I typically feel. I'm a bit chatty and so silences are hard for me. Everything moves slowly and this is hard. Yes, in business, it's definitely a different, uh, different pace, different meeting schedule. There's more communication and updates than I'm used to. We want to do more and talk less, but how do we get there? Wish we could get more feedback. I get some feedback, but I'm not sure if, if it's negative or if it's positive, okay? Lots of confusion with the communication. So I hope by the end of this, there is some more clearness on that. We have plenty so. of information on that. I think. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're gonna be overloaded with the communication information. Okay, this is one of my favorite slides, ready. Okay, so for me, this was one of the hardest things to, to kind of get used to because I'm very much like, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. Don't beat around the bush. I need you to tell me what you need from me. But in Japan, there's nonverbal communication is just as important as verbal communication. So you need to be able to be able to read into what is not said. They call that in Japanese kuki o yomu, which is, means to read the atmosphere. There's actually a slang, um, there's a often slangs in Japanese where they will take um, Roman alphabets and have that stand for something. For example, in this case, they say KY, which stands for kuki yomenai, which means people who can't read the atmosphere and is considered a very negative slang, like, oh, I don't want to hang out with this person, they're too KY, like they can't, they can't, you know, have the social awareness to really, you know, <laughs> to really fit in with everyone else. And um, an example I have of that is that I worked at a restaurant when I was quite younger and I did everything that was asked of me, but I forgot to um, empty out like the boiling vat they had for the tea or not. I, it's not that I forgot. I didn't know that was part of my duties because no one told me. And when I told my boss, hey, I'm sorry, no one told me to do this. And she's like, she was like, I can't stand those excuses. You're supposed to know this. Like, why would you think that this wouldn't be part of, you know, your duties? So that was an example of me being KY. Um, for a, an example that would take that to the business level, let's say a Japanese engineer asks you for a report on X. And you just give them X. The Japanese engineer is also expecting you to also give them Y and Z in anything that you think can be remotely related to what was already asked of you. And you're expected to almost, I feel like it, it comes across as over communicating on our, on our part and giving too much extra information, but they want to hear that. And so to they want to see the bigger picture. Like yes you're gonna clean your station, even though they didn't tell you to clean the tea, it was in yeah. your station. And yes. if you want this report, mm -hmm. well, these other projects are related as well. So again, they want this kind of over, overlook of everything and how things are connected. Yes. Not just being so focused on just this part. So we need to open up the way we see it. Exactly. And to illustrate that image of not being able to read the atmosphere, I found this image that's actually from a Japanese book talking about reading the atmosphere. And as you, you know, everyone travels by train. There are two people who are sitting apart from each other when one could easily scoot over to make room for the couple who obviously want to sit together. 
you know, another example me could be if you're in a lunch meeting in Japan and you're struggling with your chopsticks, someone is going to be observant enough to ask for a fork with you for you that you wouldn't even have to ask for. They're just constantly being very observant of the atmosphere around them. And mm -hmm. I feel like they also kind of um, maybe they don't realize it, but they expect that from everyone involved as well. Okay. So be aware of what's going on to the extent of how can you make the situation more harmonious or mm -hmm. more complete picture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or doing just a little extra than yes. what was on the list. <laughs> yes, exactly. All those things. Nice. Okay, meetings, our favorite. <laughs> so I feel like in a meeting in the West, I don't really have that much experience working in an American company. So correct me if I'm wrong on this one. I feel like people go to meetings to kind of be told what they need to know and to come to a consens cons consensus. But in Japan, meetings are for, for you to report everything you know. I think from a Western perspective that the Japanese meetings may be tedious and kind of long run. And I have a really perfect example that's going to come with the PDF handout. I found a video clip on NHK and it stars this British man who has a Japanese wife in Japan and he gets asked to join a meeting about choosing a mascot for the company. And he just like, it's, it's really over exaggerated to kind of st to send the point home, but he gets extremely frustrated because this meeting over something so simple is taking the whole time. And he's like, we should choose A. And he's very upfront about it. And then the rest of everyone else is like, yes, A is good. But you know what? B is also good. Oh yeah. And C is also good too. And he's just getting increasingly frustrated, but he doesn't realize what they're doing is that they're kind of keeping that group harmony because if they were to just single out one aspect and totally disregard everyone else's contribution, that's kind of breaking the group atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. so you need to kind of circle around and make sure everyone really feels a part of the meeting mm -hmm. and everyone knows they will eventually get to decisions, but mm -hmm. everyone needs to be a part of that decision, right? Exactly. Yeah. And of course, there's that language that I think from us kind of sounds vague, but if you kind of dig more deeper into like reading the atmosphere in Japanese culture, you realize they're saying their opinion, but they're saying it in a way that's not going to disrupt the harmony amongst the group. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then rather just having a meeting to come to a conclusion, the, dis dis the I'm sorry for that word, decision-making process is very long and is just as important as the end result. And they want to go across all the ticks. They want to make sure that, you know, as low risk as possible. And if you're stating your uh, opinion or a, a move that you want to make, you would have to explain why this is beneficial to them and is going to cause less risk than it, than it would be. Because uh, as opposed to Western business um, executives, I feel like in Japan, they tend to be very risk adverse. Whereas Westerners, we're all about being innovative. We want, if, it, if it's a risk, we still want to take it because the end goal could be amazing, right? So for example, I would say that a movie like Wolf of Wall Street would not take place in Japan. There's just no way. <laughs> yeah, and obviously Wolf of Wall Street, that's even extreme for us, right? So this is the, the hyped up version of what an American would be, right? Like, I would never take these risks. I'm pretty risk averse in general as well, you know? Mm -hmm. So there's always that, you know, that, that vision or that idea of what Americans are like. And then we also have that vision or idea of what Japan is like. And so we kind of come to this middle ground. So this is yes. the Japanese one, right? Yes. So I feel like we have that misunderstanding of thinking like, oh my gosh, why is this taking so long? Why are we not being clear in our decisions? Why is everyone agreeing with me, but then also stating how other opinions are also, you know, good too, and no one's coming up to a, a decision to make. So for us, it can be frustrating, but if we understand that they're just trying to keep that group atmosphere open. In that same video clip, there's a scene where they all go to a bar at the end of the night and they kind of have a couple of drinks and they let loose. And then they start stating their real opinions because in that environment, it would be totally appropriate for you to state any grievances because you 
you can always blame, oh, I had too much to drink, so I spoke out of line. <laughs> it's yeah. very interesting. And, and Hannah's gonna put that on the PDF she sends to everybody afterwards, and I highly recommend watching this short clip and TV show. I think it was really, really well made, even though, like we just said, little exaggerations, but they're trying to get, get the point across, so. Would it be possible to ask anyone's opinion if they've attended a meeting with Japanese colleagues and they had a similar experience of feeling like everything was really tedious? I'm just curious. You can raise your hand by clicking on the reaction if you've had this experience. We got one from Jeff. All right. We could talk about that at the end if we've got some questions about that more. Communication. Okay. Here's another aspect that I think can be very, very confusing for us because we're used to yes being yes and no being no. But like I said, in Japan, the keeping the group dynamic is paramount. So they're going to kind of not really be direct in their criticism of anyone's opinion or um, proposals. So like I used that example before about how they said A is good, but so is B and C. They're not going to flat out cause any disrupt in that group dynamic. In fact, sometimes there are awkward silences in a meeting that are used to kind of let everyone kind of de-stress and let go of that feeling so they can move on and keep the group harmony. And examples of no is going to be, I'll think about it. That sounds like a good idea. I'll get back to you. Um, sucking air between their teeth. And that's like a very Japanese thing to be like, like that's a little bit difficult. Flat out silence or if they straight up say, change the subjects could all mean no, it's not going to happen. Okay, so we need to read the room and kind of think about what's going on if one of those things happen. Mm -hmm. The sucking in the teeth is a pretty direct way of like, oh, that's not going to happen <laughs> is what I have found. <laughs> Another issue is that I think that often language kind of comes into play. So when someone, if you ask someone, do you understand? And they respond, yes. That could be like, yes, I'm listening to you. Yes, I understand what you're saying, like literally understand, but I don't necessarily agree with what you're saying. I think you, you had an instance of that as well. You talked about it as well, right, Micah? Yeah, absolutely. Um, when I started off teaching English, I worked with uh, a couple Japanese companies and I had to be really careful about scheduling the classes um, because I would say, you don't want to meet on Saturday, right? So don't ask a negative question because they're gonna say yes, as in, yes, uh, that's right, or yes, I want to meet. So I, I really suggest just being quite direct. You know, do you want to meet on Saturday? That it's very clear for them to answer yes or no because I've gotten into the confusion of the yes and no because of my questions. And that's just because of how the grammar works in Japan. So stick with, do you want, can you? Another note that laughter can be embarrassment sometimes. Obviously, if you're trying to tell a joke and they laugh, that means they're amused. But if you propose uh, some sort of opinion or proposition and everyone just kind of looks at each other and laughs, that could be just a sign of embarrassment more than humor or that, you know, that they agree with what you're saying. Yeah, so careful about that. All right, our, our <laughs> the silence that most of the people uh, uh, chose on the poll. And unfortunately, again, silence can have very different meanings. So it's again up to you to kind of really be hyper observant and kind of decipher for yourself what do you think that could mean. So silence could be simply that they're trying to translate what you said in their head and they're thinking of the proper way to respond. And this is getting back to um, the whole yes thing. There's also a big push about, you know, keeping one's honor. So for some people, when you say something in English and they don't understand, they're either just going to flat out say yes to not to lose face or they're going to keep silent. You, especially the older generation or maybe um, Japanese who haven't had a lot of experiences abroad. 
the younger generation seems to be a little bit more blunt and they're going to be, I don't understand what you said, or someone who's had a lot of experience overseas and understands how different cultures kind of interact would be more, I think, um, likely to say, I don't understand, instead of just keeping silent or saying, yes, I do, when they don't. And I mean, ad admitting that you don't understand something, I mean, even myself, I remember my first job in Mexico when I went to go teach there, I remember the boss you know, talking to me in Spanish. And at the end, she would say, Entendiste, you know, did you understand? It's really the worst question you can ask somebody mm -hmm. because they only have really two options. And there's a bit of a panic moment. Mm -hmm. Is in, And I, I can't even tell you how many times I lied, honestly. And I don't even have like an honor uh, thing in my head. I was just straight up embarrassed. Mm -hmm. and even, I wasn't even expected to be able to speak Spanish. I was the English teacher. But it's still the panic and, and the embarrassment of wishing I understood um, was there. And so I would really turn it around to, you know, would you like me to say this in a different way? Or let's walk through the steps together if you get any feeling that there's not understanding happening. If you can imagine what I said in the first slide about age and seniority, and then you're the top CEO of a company and you have this much years of experience and you're kind of looked at as the head honcho, like clearly, even if the, even if the lower lower rank employees came to a decision, if the CEO said, nope, then they have to drop that and start over it. If you as the boss have to admit that you don't understand what everyone else is saying, that's not a really good position to be in at all. Yeah, absolutely. So the tendency to say they understand and then try to figure it out later um, is, is going to be fairly high. Yeah, surprising maybe to us, but that's, that's just simply what is typically going on. So there has to be some understanding on your part if you want to make sure that the message is clear. Mm -hmm. um, silence can also mean I don't know, like what's the next course of action, so can you please throw me kind of a bone to give me an idea of how to respond and how to where to go next. Sometimes silence simply means there's nothing to be said. So quit being a noisy American and chatting all the time, you know. And then there's also what I said earlier about meetings and sometimes silence is used to diffuse a situation that might feel stressful or an atmosphere of like disagreement to keep that group harmony. So I have here I disagree but I want to avoid direct confrontation. So I, that means I use that silence to please consider my position and to re reconsider your position. Your statement is making me a little bit uncomfortable. So please think of a way where you can sympathize with me and kind of keep our relationship a stable, good, harmony, harmonious relationship. Mm -hmm. Very good. All right, overall communication and how it's kind of viewed. I feel language-wise, Japan really likes to make little, um, you know, puns <laughs> using, yeah, <laughs> with sounds. So for example, they took the first syllables of each of these words, hokoku, then naku, and sodan, to say horen so, which means spinach in Japanese. <laughs> so which, that's why I have the picture of Popeye, because it means spinach. So basically, hokoku is to report. That means you are expected to report any latest developments on assignments, even if there is nothing to really report. If there is no change, you're expected to report back. Everything's, you know, everything's the same. And you're also expected to kind of anticipate what could happen to show that you're preparing for it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like so I would say, over communication. Exactly. Whatever we think is over communication, it might be like the sweet spot for them. Mm -hmm. Renraku means to inform. It also means to communicate. So you are expected to always keep in contact with the rel relevant people, leaders, coordinators, stakeholders that you are on assignment with. And soldan means to consult. So you are expected to also reach out to these, um, to these higher ups to get advice how to resolve the issues. That could, you know, even if it's something that you feel like you could do on your own, it would kind of look bad to kind of take initiative on yourself instead of consulting your superiors. Yeah, you don't want to do it all, right? And you don't want to stick out. <laughs> yes, no sticking out. So 
in, in summary for this is tell what's happening and more, mm -hmm. tell what's happening and more to as many people as possible. Mm -hmm. And if there's any issue, talk to someone about it before, before going forward. And I completely understand that last point because the whole idea of like um, group harmony means that these kind of hierarchies and titles exist for a reason. And they're quite strict about like, hey, this is your position and this is your job. Do you want to, you know, keep that as harmonious as possible, right? So that includes like, okay, if he's my superior, then I need to ask him before I take, you know, over and, and use my own initiative because otherwise it's like, hey, I can do your job. But that's not very respectful and that's not doing a good job of keeping that group dynamic in place. Yeah, makes sense. Communication. So uh, I, another issue that I felt when I was living in Japan was that this even came up as a college student when trying to keep in contact with my classmates or my teachers is that I feel like in the West, our communication um, road is like a straight line and in Japan it's like, uh, 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 uh. and how I really felt that, and this is a bit of a tangent, but in Japanese universities, they have clubs, like after school activities like they do here, but they're taken very seriously. And within these clubs, you kind of learn the hierarchy and how to interact and how to deal with feedback and communicate communication as you would in the workplace. In my case, I was in the festival committee, committee and I really kind of had a like a bit of a culture shock because I felt like, I thought this was just fun, but like I'm learning how to like, you know, to act in the workplace as well. So that did a great job of preparing me for that. And to get back on topic, usually positive feedback, usually they're not gonna give any positive feedback no feedback is the positive feedback. That means you did a great job and we don't need to really comment on anything further. So if you don't hear anything, usually from anybody, it means that you're doing a good job. Um, negative and constructive feedback is gonna come out a little vague, especially among your peers, because again, they don't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable. Usually it's given indirectly or within a third party, you may get an email. And for that, I would also say, if you're looking to get feedback, I would try to ask someone privately instead of it coming up in a meeting or in front of other people, because then you're going to put that person on the spot and they're going to feel really, really uncomfortable. And from their standpoint, any, they may seem like kind of micromanaging on the constructive and negative feedback, but to them, it's not negative. It's just saying like, hey, we want to be the best that we can be. So in order to do that, I'm going to clip any edges and tell you what you need to do to kind of like to um, greater the reputation of the company and uphold the standards that we expect. Mm -hmm. Great. Decision making. Another thing that everyone said was a bit more challenging. So this will be yeah. good to get into how decisions are made. So this explains a lot, guys. Mm -hmm. So the first one, there's two main ones I kind of go over in this in this webinar. Uh, number one is going to be called the Dingi system or the Dingi show. And basically, it's a written proposal that's going to be passed along with this paper you see right here. And that's also going to include any data information attached to it. And it's going to follow the hierarchy. So right here, it says president. And then we have the managing director. And then we have the section chief and so on and so on. And here it says approve and disapprove. So they, everyone has a stamp instead of signing a signature, everyone has a stamp with their um, last name character on it and they give their either stamp of approve, approval or disapproval. And for any kind of um, suggestions or changes they wanna make, they write it down below. And so it's literally passed down the line of everyone and then is constantly kind of reformed and changed until everyone kind of agrees and comes to a consensus. Wow. And that way, everyone's kind of held accountable because part of having that group identity and dynamic is that everyone is informed, everyone is a stakeholder, everyone is responsible for what happens. There's no singling out of, hey, Tanaka-san, you know, you didn't, you didn't do this, right? Everyone's kind of on the same page. And it does come across, I think, for some people like, oh my gosh, that takes up so much time. But it's really being thorough and making sure that everyone's on the same page. Absolutely. <clears throat> seen as, as tedious, but 
if you do it this way, there's no way to let anyone out of any step of the process, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Another, okay. Now we have the nimawashi, and that literally means going around the roots. And I'm not sure if everyone is familiar, but with the Toyota company, they, they have like these 12 pillars of the Toyota production system. And this is one of them, is the, is the Newamashi decision-making process. And basically anytime someone wants to propose a new assignment, it's just kind of the same to me. It seems similar to the Ringi system. Instead of being on paper, it's all um, verbal communication. Everyone kind of goes around and talks to each other based on their rank and gives a, the proposal and gets feedback on whether they approve or disapprove or any suggestions. And again, it keeps going around in a circle till everyone has kind of reached a consensus. And again, to make sure that all stakeholders are all, all on board. And it shows how important the decision-making process is. The fact that there are two names of decision-making processes, right? I mean, I can't personally think of, you know, a decision-making process that is typically used in companies in the U.S. Maybe I'm wrong, but if, if it's been given a name, it's pretty high up there in importance. <laughs> All right, talk to us. This is a big, this is very, very different. This is one of the bigger differences I discovered. So I feel like in the States, when we have a contract, it's pretty thorough and specific with a guide of kind of, you know, limitations and promises that are to be expected and upholded. But in Japan, a contract basically summarizes that you are willing and agreeing to work with this person. And usually no legal representative is, is involved and is uh, it's written for the purpose of that, if there's any changes that need to be made in the contract, you can easily make them. And I think from a Western um, standpoint, that comes off as being vague, brief. It doesn't really show enough details that will, again, prevent later disputes. But in Japan, they look at our contracts as being like, hey, why are you getting you know, legal representation involved? Do you not, do you not trust me? And they're also too limiting because they're thinking, well, if things change, if someone says something different, then we need to be able to, you know, adapt accordingly and change the agreements on the contract. Very good. So but, to me, this is kind of the opposite of what I would think the contracts would be like. So Exactly. But I think larger, um, more metropolitan companies have kind of changed and they're more willing to kind of go the Western route. But if you go to like, or more countryside small company in Japan, they're probably gonna do it the Japanese way. A little more lax, more flexibility. Very good. Okay. All right. So, you know, here we have the customer is, is always right. In Japan, they have the customer is God. And that is just as, <laughs> as a big contrast as you think it does. So I don't know if you noticed that if you have any, um, experience with with going to Japan just I feel like the quality of production on things is like subpar none like every everything is amazing like even the little wrappers for food you know when you go to a grocery store they will specifically like bag things certain things differently so it doesn't mess up with any of the other products that you've bought just the quality is so like amazing. <laughs> cold things so they can keep each other cold yeah and even like the vending machines have a separate, you know, area where you can get both cold drinks and hot drinks, which to me is like, I'm like, my mind is blown and I really do miss those vending machines a lot. So part of it is that there is such an importance of being able to, to do your best to meet the customer demands. And also with your competitors, like if someone is going to increase a tax on a product, then all the other companies are going to act accordingly because you're supposed to kind of be all on the same standards as your competitors as well. So what that basically means with this is that you're supposed to kind of refrain from outwardly saying, I can't do that or that's impossible. You have to show an effort that you're trying to meet the demands of another company or your customer. And that's all it basically means. It means do everything in your absolute power to kind of come to an agreement to what the customer demands. And if you can't just show a lot of effort that you have tried your best or probably offer 
an alternative that would also be a benefit for the customer. Wonderful. That was incredibly thorough. Hannah, I want to say thank you so much. And we really just barely discussed this, but I did want to ask really quickly, one of the uh, people attending today just asked for a suggestion for a gift. I know that in the future, we're going to be doing a, a more in-depth look at gift giving and other aspects of the culture. So we won't give it all away, but do you mm -hmm. have a suggestion of just a little gift for a coworker? Okay. Well, it really depends. That's pretty easy because I have so much experience with buying stuff for people. If you're buying for a whole group, usually something that is like a local gourmet item, like coffees in a nice canister, teas. I remember that I bought like a C's candy box for like all the other teachers. I've also bought stuff from Bucky's because it doesn't get more Texas than Bucky's, right? Like a container of the, the fudge. If it's for a specific person, usually a very nice, you know, pen or a stationary set, card holders, they're kind of more higher brand. You don't necessarily have to go like Mont Blanc route and spend like hundreds of dollars, but something that internationally they can recognize as a nice high brand item. The pens, the pens are great. The pens and the card holders are great in the little box that's kind of has really nice presentation because presentation really is key. That's exactly it. I, I don't have um, much experience giving presents, but being the English teacher of so many Japanese, oh God. <laughs> woo, yeah, lots and lots of little presents down to like a tiny, um, you know, little doll from Japan, just something really cool, you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. um, and, and just something that said something about Japan. I definitely got some tea. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely got um, little stationary things, like mm -hmm. you said, so very common. Yeah. I would say just something that represents where you're from. Mm -hmm. will be the most special, don't you think? Exactly. The only thing I would avoid is if you're getting something like flowers, there are certain flowers that oh, are yeah. pertaining to like funerals and you don't want to do that. Typically four is an unlucky number. So um, things that come in fours, to be blunt, like the you have the numbers ichi, ni, san, shi, or yon, and in the shi for four can also mean death. So things that come in fours aren't necessarily... Yeah. <laughs> ideas but no you're right I remember as a teacher every single time a, a teacher went to their hometown or they traveled back they would come because Japan's really good this at this if you go each prefecture has a special gourmet item whether it be fruit or sweets and they have these beautiful gift boxes just ready for you to buy and then you give everyone so that's where I got like those these candy idea when I ever visit the states wonderful and I wanted to allow a little bit of time for people to ask specific questions. Um, if anyone does have a question, I hope that you are allowed to chat. Let's see. Does anyone have a question? Or to share an experience if they want to do that as well. Oh yes, absolutely. And I'm going to write in the chat to everyone because some people might not know where it is. Right, I'll give you a couple more minutes if you need to leave. We have finished with our presentation for today. If you are thinking about your question or want to hang around and turn your webcam on and ask it directly to us, would absolutely love that. I'm all about the real talking. <laughs> and we are gonna have another webinar in two weeks going over more specifically Japanese business meetings and what is expected in those. And also going to dinner with clients mm -hmm. and going to dinner with your coworkers or your colleagues and kind of what is expected there. Mm -hmm. And like Hannah said, she is, has put together a PDF that kind of goes through the bullet points of this that you can give to anyone that you think might benefit. And I really mm -hmm. highly recommend watching the video. Yes, that video is so good. Yes, watching that video to make, make sure. Oh, a, a suggestion for short Japanese phrases. Um, 
I believe we are going to be doing a Japanese phrase class. Um, in two weeks, we might be able to add some of this to that one. And so I'll be putting on LinkedIn again, Micah Bellew is the name on LinkedIn, and I always post our webinars there. So we are gonna be going over short Japanese phrases at the webinar in two weeks. So June is the month of Japanese. July is Spanish from Spain to Mexico. And then after that, in August, it's gonna be HR and global mobility. So working globally in general, how to adjust and, and make sure that everyone is involved and can communicate well when you work in a multilingual workplace. So add me on LinkedIn if you would like. And Ray would like to know, Ray was in Japan for a while. He works for United. Um, is the Incan still very prevalent today? He'd like to know. The Incan, do you mean like the little drills that they, that they used to do or for, for reference for the people that don't know what Incan means? Hey, um, hi, Hannah. Thank you. Hi. Yeah, the, uh, the personal stamp, the income. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. my gosh, hey. that, is still, that is still very much prevalent. I had such a hard time because I never got one. You and didn't get so one. <laughs> I didn't get one. Um, I managed, I don't know if it was because I was a student at the time, but when I actually signed up for, like, the banks, they, they let me use a signature. And when I was working in, in a in a Japanese school, they would just have me sign my signature in the little round area where they would stamp the, the inkan or honkan. So yes, it's still very, very prevalent and it still comes up like, oh, you don't have one? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it would it, still be a little bit of a tassel, but I managed to work there for about five or six years without getting one myself, but it's still very prevalent. Gotcha. Thank you. And great, really great presentation, by the way. You, it just, I, I relived. 10 years of Japan in 30 minutes, because you touched on so many things. I worked in education in the Kyoto Inkai, in the boards oh, of education. Awesome. So not in, not in a company, but I, I also worked at some companies doing um, you know, English lessons with them, a big pharmaceutical company, some others. Mm -hmm. So you really nailed everything. But I will say, just not to take up other people's time, mm -hmm. but um, as far as the, uh, when you touched on meetings, mm -hmm. A lot of what you said triggered me from, you know, old memories and stuff. The Incon was one because my name is Ray Cunningham. Mm -hmm. So I had one that had RC. Mm -hmm. And then when I switched from a very rural area to Kyoto, mm -hmm. I went to a different board of education. Um, they would not accept my RC Incon. And so they made another RC with a different, slightly different font so that that would be legal. And there was a lot of uh, sucking in air through the teeth. And the, this was just a decision whether to use my income for setting up, you know, say the apartment, different things in Kyoto. We're talking days. Yeah. And they had to meet about this and stuff. Um, but I will say uh, a few expressions I thought of were um, shoganai, mm -hmm. which is it, it can't, can't be helped. Be helped yeah. <laughs> and, and when we were talking about trying to reach a decision about something from say the English teacher side. Mm -hmm. um, and it was on a trajectory like this to where we're gonna do things this way, and then suddenly, no, no, I'm not gonna do that. And it was just Shogunai, mm -hmm. obviously because someone didn't wanna do it. Mm -hmm. And I became, um, you were talking about indirect feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, I was trying to think of it as you were talking sort of behind my back, not in a rude way, mm -hmm. but I would find out from others. Um, there's an expression, he han teki, mm -hmm. which is critical. Yeah. And people would walk around behind me saying, ah, oh, rei son, he han teki. Because I was, I didn't see it as critical and I wasn't criticizing, but I was always trying to push to do things a little differently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, that meant that I was being critical. So. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, thank you very much. This was very, very interesting and very, very thorough. So 
hopefully oh, we'll have so we can talk about all this more but and oh yeah um, i i i great. have when, when when mika approached me she was like one one webinar and i had enough information to cover <laughs> oh <laughs> but oh, i enjoyed because like i had a very similar experience to as you so it was really cool to to meet other foreigners who kind of like get why some of this stuff like it's it's very interesting for me to talk about but i was kind of triggered writing about like oh man i remember all the little instances yes <laughs> yeah very much and i i had some friends that went to icu so oh cool <laughs> pretty cool so i'll let other people jump in but thank you and good good job good choice micah <laughs> yeah absolutely in a couple of weeks we're going to have another one from the japanese perspective because we always want to get everyone's perspective and noriko san is going to be maybe we can add in some japanese phrases mm -hmm. because a couple of people wanted to get that it's just nice to be able to greet someone in their own language and if anyone else has any questions we are here i love questions it's the teacher in me oh i have a quick question that's kind of not related to but it's like would i be able just because i i would like to be able to see noriko's presentation even though i may be aware of some of the languages would, would i be able to join in as like Oh, anyone. Can join. Yeah. Yes, yes, of course. Anyone can join any of the presentations. Like I said, the best way to get on it, um, to see everything we're doing is to um, just connect with me on LinkedIn because I will typically post about three or four times before we have it. So right after this, I'm going to be posting about the next one. Every two weeks, we have something about culture, language, or global communication. That's our goal for 2020, education out the wazoo. <laughs> All right, everyone, thank you so much for coming. <clears throat> and I put my email down there. If you have a question or if something happens next week <clears throat> and you say, oh my God, what, what would Hannah do? Or what would Ray do? <laughs> Please ask us about it. We're happy to help you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day and weekend. Stay safe. <laughs>